As one can see, there isn't too many details that we can see on the outside of a parietal bone. What becomes most significant is perhaps just the number of different sutures it is participating. So we're looking at the right-sided parietal bone, pretty much just the same as I have as the separate bone. And we can see here on the top part of the skull that with a contralateral bone, it forms a mid-sagittal or just a sagittal suture. Then there will be another suture that's formed between parietal and frontal bone that is coronal suture or frontal suture. And at the back, we're going to have another irregularly shaped suture that is made between left and right sided parietal bones and the occipital bone because it resembles Greek letter lambda. It is called the lambdoid suture. Seeing the skull from the above, it becomes most obvious that this is the greatest diameter of the skull that we have here and if the ultrasound of a fetus is done this is what is called the biparietal diameter but using the skull here we can point out that this greatest bulge that the parietal bone forms is actually its tuber and this is where the primary center of ossification would form and would gradually progress in all directions until full ossification of parietal bone is done on the outside we can see practically two curved lines that are going across the temple. They're called the superior and inferior temporal lines. On this skull that I have, they are not specifically too prominent and I will try my best to show what it looks like. The superior temporal line is actually a reflection of the fascia of the temporalis muscle that otherwise occupies the entire temple. Inferior temporal line, which is truly not visible in this skull, is attachment point of muscular fibers. So when we palpate this, uh, the head, the side of the head of a living person, it is going to be very hard to evaluate that there is a muscle which is quite thick. It entirely fills up this space under the temporozygomatic arch because of its firm fascia, which makes it quite flush against the skull and it is very difficult to evaluate the thickness of the muscle. The muscle is very important because it is one of the four muscles of mastication and it would be instrumental for our ability to elevate the mandible and produce the bite. While we are here, I want to show you also something that is happening quite frequently, but it is not considered to be part of the standardized skull. You see here, this little bone is developed on its own and actually it fits in between temporal and the right-sided parietal bone. This is sutural bone or extranumerary bone. So sometimes it could be a conflicting and confusing point because should it happen that the person's x-ray is done on the right side because of suspected head injury, it is sometimes quite difficult to evaluate whether something like this actually is a fracture line or it could represent just part of somewhat unusual anatomy demonstrating those extranumerary bones. Let's talk for a couple of minutes about simplest bone of the skull, the parietal bone. So what we have here is the left-sided parietal bone practically by itself and why I like it like this, it's just to make sure that we accept something else as a concept. This is the bone which could be also classified as a flat bone. What is the main quality of flat bones? We can see if we zoom in into one of the sutures where we can find a composition of a bone. It is made of internal table, which is a compact bone, then we have the outer table, which is also compact, but core of the bone is a spongy bone. Seeing it like this, obviously that its uneven serrated edges are pointing out to a variety of different bones that this right-sided parietal bone will make a joint or suture with, and of course it's going to be frontal bone to the front, other side contralateral parietal bone, and at the back, we're going to have a suture that will be formed between parietal and occipital bones. 
Here at the lower end of the bone, there will be a somewhat different looking suture, overlapping suture, because this is where squama of the temporal bone is going to fit. Let's take a look at the parietal bone using the entire skull. So this is again the right side of the parietal bone on its own. This is the area of tuber and also we're not having much better luck to demonstrate position of superior and inferior temporal lines. Perhaps camera is unable to capture it. I see here the curved line that goes across parietal bone that is the superior temporal line and uh, that is attachment of fascia. Let's take a look on the inside at the internal table. Internal table appears to be quite interesting because it also looks like it has been carved showing quite a large number of irregularly running grooves. What is happening here is that one major artery, the middle meningeal artery, that is otherwise a branch of the maxillary artery, enters the skull through the sphenoid bone at its spine. It has its own opening and then advances itself in between skull cap and dura, external meninges of the brain. So when this happens, practically it is making a major imprint against the internal table of the bone. This middle meningeal artery could be sometimes quite nasty because even minor to the side of the head, in particular temple and the squama of the occipital bone may actually create a hairline fracture that will also cut across main trunk of the middle meningeal artery creating quite significant intracranial hemorrhage which is called epidural or extradural hemorrhage and if not recognized immediately and not responded to need to actually intervene to operate and to stop the bleeding unfortunately such a hemorrhage could have a very unfavorable outcome.